All right. Thank you for tuning in to another edition of Casual Highlights Podcast, where we strive to educate, inform, and inspire while having casual conversations in sports. My name is Al High. My man T. Scott, Tyler Scott, What's up, everybody? is in the building. We decided we're going to do it in virtual form. Well, not virtual, but we live from uh, Fabutainment Studio. Shout out to the founder of Fabutainment for having us come in a uh, studio and, and 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 have a great time um, filming this. Shout out uh, Francesca. Well, I'm about to mess her name up. Francesca Williams. So Fabutainment, um, check them out on Instagram, Facebook. Man, she's doing big things. So we're going to get into it, man. It was a crazy weekend in the world of sports. Man, we had the women cutting up. President Dr. First Lady Jill Biden with her crazy. Well, we'll get into that here in just a moment. We're also going to dive into the men's uh, Final Four, and we got some hot takes for you. Anyway, but I do want to give a special shout out before we get going to BS3 Network. Um, you can listen to this episode. If you listen on podcast, you can listen to this and check out our shows at bs3network.com. So with that, without further ado, we're going to get it started. Yeah. Now let's talk about the men's Final Four real quick. You know, that first game on that Saturday, we're going to start with Florida Atlantic versus San Diego State. A um, couple key points I took from that. FAU was up by seven points at halftime. And then San Diego State comes out of the locker room. They outscore the Owls 39 to 31 in the second half. Mm -hmm. Just what were your thoughts on that little segment right there? Put it like this. San Diego State had to, to dig to get back into that game. I thought FAU had, had the thing under control. I believe what happened with FAU is that they ran out of gas and that the defense and size of San Diego State literally took over. They – FAU was just hitting shots. Mm -hmm. they, they, they were making everything in the first half. But then they clamped up, and, 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 and San Diego State just came in there and slowed them down. And we got to take our hats off to FAU and to San Diego State. Um, I think the last time we had, like, a mid-major Final Four was 2011. We had VCU and Butler. Mm -hmm. And that you know how that, that game went down to the wire. But this particular man – Dusty May is up and coming. Um, great, great head coach. They only lost four games this year. Yeah. And, and and they just found ways to win this year. So um, to the game itself, they just ran out of gas. That's all it was, man. It's all, it was all about a game of nutrition, a game of uh, who who gonna have who who's gonna have the last shot. And um, fortunately for San Diego State, they had they made they made the last shot. And won the game. Yeah. I want to give credit to though to the Aztec Center. Um, Nathan Mensa, he guarded the Owl Center Golden the entire game. Golden was held to five points on only four total shots. Um, and you know, they talked about Mensa going into that game too, or at least after the game, just that you know, going into the national championship, San Diego State has size. Yeah. Um, UConn has size too, but they were really particular on San Diego State with Nathan Mensa standing at 6'10". Mm -hmm. um, and that really affected Golden for the FAU Owls. Um, but credit to um, San Diego State head coach. I can't think of his name right now. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, credit to them. You know, they were down by – they were down going into the final shot a little over 10 seconds on that final play. They have one timeout left. They don't call timeout. Right. They let the Aztecs drive down the court. Bro, Co Lamont. Co Co I'm sorry, Coach Brian Dutcher. Brian Dutcher, yes. Uh, Coach Dutcher just lets them go down the court. Lamont Butler's last to hold the ball, mm -hmm. and he is looking to drive the lane to the right. It's closed off, but he pulls back, kind of gives his opponent, you know, a little hesitation move. Mm -hmm. And then pulls up with like a fadeaway type shot and it just swishes. Yeah. So credit to Lamont Butler. Shout out to Lamont Butler. Yeah. On that game way shot to give San Diego State their first national championship appearance ever. Look, that was the only excitement for the for the for the weekend in the men's final four, man. It just sure wasn't nothing else. I'm just gonna say it like that. <laughs> shout out, man, to uh to to that to, to Mr. Lamont, man, for, for, for that particular 
game winning shot. Lord knows that second game, boy. You knew we knew what time it was. Yeah, <laughs> we knew was the whole U- week. It was UConn time because <laughs> it was UConn versus Miami. UConn dominating all their opponents they faced in this tournament. Um, they led by 10 plus throughout the second half of that game against Miami. Mm-hmm. Um, how about though? Adama Sinogo hitting two straight three pointers in the first half. Bruh. I don't even think he had taken more than five the entire year or his career. Bruh. Big time players do big time things in big time moments. And um, the shooting guard I like reminds me of, of Ray, Ray Allen 2.0, uh, Hawkins. Yes. Um, was under the weather. Mm-hmm. So for, for him, Sonogo, my, is that how you pronounce it? Sonogo? Yeah. Unbelievable tournament. All like just, just dominate. We, we just gonna get out here, and when you hitting, you you hitting shots. When mm-hmm. you making shots, you making shots. And um, let me give credit to, to Jim Larinaga and um, in Miami, um, the ACC Player of the Year, uh, Isaiah Wong, um, the other uh, Nigel Pack. That particular back that backcourt, they they weren't making shots like like, like they were used to. In the in the in their first four tournament games, they were making shots when they needed to make shots, and they were trying. To, and when they it seemed like the second half, they were trying to make a run, but UConn had answers for them, man. Every time UConn had an answer, but I love the fight that Miami put this year, and 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 to knock off a number one seed in Houston, then come back. To beat the number two seed Texas, you down double digits, man. It was we got to give credit to what credit to do. So um they, they just outplayed. UConn was on a mission. We knew everybody in the mama knew. Well, let me see how many points Miami gonna lose by. We all knew. <laughs> it's like they might have a fighting chance, you know. But um you can't you can't prevail. Yeah, Sonogo had the double double, 21 points, 10 rebounds. <laughs> Um, Hawkins had a quiet 16 points, I think, on only nine total shot attempts. Yeah. So we knew he was under the weather, but, you know, credit to UConn. They move on to face San Diego State. We're going to dive into that right now, too, just real quick. Mm -hmm. Um, The biggest takeaway I take from that game where it was just no contest, San Diego State had only hit four field goals in, in 22 possessions at one point in that game. So you know that UConn being up by double digits in the first half, you kind of had a feeling that UConn was just going to continue to just, you know, play it out like they had the entire tournament and just ambush anyone they had in their sights. I just think <sighs> UConn probably could have been up more because the first half of San Diego State was in that, in that drought where they weren't making any they, – they couldn't hit anything. I think UConn could have easily put them to sleep by like over 20 points. They were fortunate to was like they were like down 16, 18 at the half. And just once again, the dominance of UConn. We we everybody and their mama in America <laughs> knew it was coming. We just knew, man. Like, yo, okay, this is UConn is supposed to win this game. Yeah. They played, we got to give credit, Dan Hurley. They play like a number one seed, the one of the most under the radar number one seed, what a number one seed is supposed to do. Dominated everybody. In particular, the West region is the was the hardest region out of all the regions this year. And to come out and just averaging 20 points per win. Mm-hmm. I congratulations. Um and and then and uh I think Adam Sanogo was the finals. Uh, he might have been the MVP. Yeah, he, yeah. All same player. Yeah. yeah, I think he was a tournament MVP. My goodness, hey, that the size really then that size really affected San Diego, especially in the second half. They couldn't San Diego State couldn't get to the couldn't get to the hole. The day they tried to post up shots, which which is short, and so I'm like, okay, this, the size is really affecting them. Yeah, I mean Sanogo is their starting center, but. I mean, UConn has a big, tall white guy the who's like set, yeah. almost seven foot. Right. And he comes in, hits like two free throws down the stretch. Yeah. And you're like, dang, like if Sonogo leaves UConn, 
they've got a guy who can step in right away and just fill that void. Oh, they're going to listen. UConn is not going nowhere. UConn is, listen, with Dan Hurley, NIL money, the UConn women, hey, the store is Connecticut, hard for Connecticut, bro. UConn is not going anywhere. The, the, they are about to be the beast of the, of the uh, Big East again. Mm-hmm. You know they had, you know they had left and went to the American Conference and played around because when the Big East broke up the first time, and and they are they are where they need to be. Yeah. Um, and I touched on it earlier, but Jordan Hawkins had the 16 points in this particular game against San Diego State. So they had told, uh, said that he was questionable heading into the financial, national championship. Obviously, he played 16 points on nine shots. Big win for UConn, their fifth national championship since, I think, 1999. Yeah, 25, five, so and, five and 25, five and 24. Does that, does that dictate them as a true blue blood, even so, though their national championships come from way back? So I'm torn right now. I want to call them a blue blood. But if we go back historically and traditionally, the definition of blue bloods was like the original teams that started with basketball, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Kansas. Now, over time, we have added Duke in the mix as a blue blood. We've added Indiana, which I'm like, I don't know if that's, you know, that was Bob Knight era, you know, as relevancy. Uh, we've UCLA, the godfather of uh, of coaching, probably Mr. John Wooden, mm-hmm. you know, 11 national championships. We should be able to have this, like, that should be a top tier program. Like, could I say blue? We could say some people could say blue blood. I'm gonna say top tier because the history of what the blue blood is, but they're right up there. Like they, if, if they, you know how Kansas, Duke, um, Kentucky, Michigan State has have, has the Champions Classic. Mm-hmm. I really think they need to add probably like maybe two more, four more teams, and you need to add a champion like UConn in there. You need to probably add like a North Carolina playing one bracket, UCLA to have to me true true champions. But Gonzaga, you know them, them, those type of schools. I don't know if Gonzaga's a champion. They haven't won a national title, but mm-hmm. but um, but I'm a I'm gonna say UConn top tier, but I can't call them the original blue blood because I'm still torn about it. How let me next week die? Yeah. <laughs> I mean it's it's hard to. Yeah, you don't want to put them up there quite yet because they haven't been relevant since maybe Jim Calhoun. But also, you got to think back to when Kevin Ollie led them to one of those championships way back in the day. Yeah, um, that was back in fourteen. Yeah, and then you know you don't put you don't put them up there with like North Carolina Duke yet because North Carolina is still North Carolina, Duke is still Duke. Um, North Carolina had down here, we all know. So we'll see what they have in store for next year. Mm-hmm. Um, but Dan Hurley, credit to him too, national championship. I think this was his fifth year coaching the team. Yeah. I'm not sure what his contract situation is, but do you feel like the school kind of like gives him somewhat of an extension going into the next season? Of course, they better give him an extension. Why would why why would they not? <laughs> no clue, bro. But. <laughs> but hey, but you know what? Crazy things have happened. <laughs> Crazy stuff has happened before. So yeah. yeah. So congrats to UConn winning the national championship. Yes. It was a crazy tournament. We finished it off with those two teams, four seed versus a five seed. Um, one of the most unexpected Final Fours we've ever seen yeah. since I've been alive anyway. Yeah. Um, so it was crazy to see UConn win. I think I saw today that maybe only six to eight brackets in America had picked San Diego State to play UConn in the national championship. Boy, something went down. So it's a 0.04 percentage of ESPN brackets everywhere. So credit to the Huskies. Boy, you was a psychic if you picked that for the national championship, <laughs> yeah. bro. Like, what? <laughs> so then I'm going to go ahead and dive into the men's postseason awards. And I want to kind of divvy this out a little bit between the Naismith picks and the AP picks. Okay. Um, the AP picks, I'm going to dive on the Coach of the Year one. All right. AP had uh, Shaka Smart getting right. Coach of the Year. Yeah. They were picked ninth out of 11 teams in the Big East mm-hmm. to finish. Um, they go on and win the conference regular season and conference tournament, have an early exit in the national uh, tournament. Um, but, you know, when it's all said and done, the Naismith Awards come out, 
they go with what I feel would have been the coach of the year from the beginning, mm. Jerome Tang. Mm -hmm. So Jerome Tang takes a brand new team. He was an associate head coach at Baylor for 19 years. Marquise Noel, Ishmael Masood, only returning players at K-State going into this year. He goes out on the recruiting trail, brings in all these transfers, builds the team, all these guys you've never heard of. Yeah, from yeah. mid-major teams, yeah. some low-level ACC teams, yeah. and he builds a team. They go on, finish really high in the Big 12, and you know exit in the Elite Eight. I would have thought the AP writers would agree with me and pick Jerome Tang as the coach of the year. But what are your thoughts on AP kind of swaying to uh, pick Shaka Smart over Jerome Tang? I cannot knock Shaka Smart in the job that he's done. So Shaka's team, Marquette, they beat UConn three times, the national champion. So off the rip, like, phenomenal. Um, and they were picked ninth out of 11 because the previous last year, they got smoked in the tournament. And I was a little concerned, you know, that the way that North Carolina beat the brakes off them in the time, like this is Marquette making the turn. <laughs> what is this? So I always, okay, I always be like, okay, the Naismith and the AP, sometimes I get confused. And sometimes I'm like, oh, it's the same award, but this it's the writers of the Associated Poll, Coach Poll, and then you have Jim Naismith, the legendary coach. So I mean, and then knowing Jerome Tang, you know, he's right here in Kansas State, the job he's done. I think they're both deserving of it. I don't want to take one award from, from each and give it a sweep for, for Tang and one for Shock. I think they both did an excellent job, and both teams were picked to be at the bottom, especially Kansas State. You know, Bruce Weber and in, in, in the high turnover, I think he only had two scholarship players, uh, Marquise Noel and um, Ishmael Sue. Ishmael Sue, like those, he only had two. And you had to go out there and and really build it from scratch. And then to also get the, the key was Keontae. Because I always said when um, Jerome started, I talked something about, I said, K State, it'll be a victim if they make the tournament. They'll make the tournament because of coaching. But when they got Keontae Johnson, I said, okay, now this is a chance where they're going to win at least one or two games in the tournament with Keontae. And um, we see the, the level that Keontae brought to the team when it comes to like the play level. Cause he was, he was NBA about to head to the NBA draft, like about to be second, late first round, early second round before he had that, that medical condition. Mm -hmm. So um, it's all about coaching, man. And, and school. Can you coach these, these boys and teaching old school teaching? Yeah. Can you teach and get them, in position to win. And I, I'm just going to give credit. Both of them did an excellent, phenomenal job. Right. And, and and even with Marquette in the second round, we knew, I knew Michigan State was just tough. Izzo was just tough in the tournament, bro. We just, just tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Shaka Smart, you know, started at BCU back in the day, turned them into a national powerhouse, goes to Texas, does what he does there, has a little bit of unfortunate happenings, goes to Marquette, and, you know, the rest is history with why he was a candidate for both awards. Mm -hmm. um, so credit to Shaka Smart, too. So I, I am a little biased. I would have loved to Jerome Tang to win both awards just because I I can't imagine a coach just stepping in to a new situation with two players on your team and having to rebuild that thing like crazy mm -hmm. and go up against the power of the Big 12 when you got KU, Oklahoma, Texas. <laughs> yeah. Texas Tech and so forth. Yeah. So credit to Jerome Tang. I think that's the best coaching job I've ever seen mm -hmm. in my time. Um, Naismith Player of the Year was no question Zach Eady, mm -hmm. seven foot mammoth for Purdue, average double double. Um, he was probably the best player entering the national tournament up until they faced Fairleigh Dickinson in that first round. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> So, Holy Dickens, boy. <laughs> Where y'all was at? <laughs> but, you know, Purdue's early exit did not phase the writers or National Association to not select him. Yeah. Um, but the biggest thing I want to look at, too, Defensive Player of the Year was Jalen Clark. Mm -hmm. And Jalen Clark plays for UCLA. He gets hurt in the conference tournament, and it's like a season-ending thing. So he doesn't even play for UCLA in the national tournament. They still make – the second round against Gonzaga? Sweet 16. Sweet 16. Sweet 16 against Gonzaga. 
they still make it that far, but you know, they go ahead and take away what, you know, any other candidate had on paper and go ahead and name him defensive player of the year. What do you know about that? I don't know too much about it, but I'm going to, I'm going to brag on Mick Cronin coaching. It goes back to coaching and veteran led leadership. That team came out every night hungry. The, the, the times that I watched UCLA, because not everybody watches Pac-12 at the dark, and all you know, they 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 they're snoring and farting in the bed. Um, you know, with coaching, coaching matters, and to always have those guys ready every night. They they were about what a, a, a two points away from beating Arizona in in the uh, in the Pac-12 tournament. Really, one shot away from making it to the Elite Eight against UConn. So. Play, I got to give credit to um, players step in and do what they need to do. When, when one player is out, you step up. But you but you had a – that's the times where you have to have a class and be able to lead. And so you can even say Mick Cronin could be coach of the year for the job. It, was he a candidate for the Naismith or the uh, – I don't believe so. I, I, I'm pretty sure it was Jerome Tang, Shark Smart, Kelvin Sampson, Kelvin, and yeah, uh, did well, yeah. Matt Painter. Yeah, Painter, yeah. But um, I didn't watch too much of of uh, Mr. Jalen, but Mr. Jalen Clark. But that's what they, you know, they're big on also defense too. Defense leads leads to their points. So um, that being said, man, I just got, I'm gonna give credit to UCLA, and they were, what they were, so the, the crazy thing about that. I want to go back to that particular game, Gonzaga UCLA. Mm -hmm. UCLA was up 13-14. They go back. <laughs> Here come Gonzaga make this run. They're up by like ten to twelve points. UCLA makes this. I turn the game off. I turn the TV back on. UCLA up by one. Am I reading this correctly? UCLA up by one. Looking at my tablet at work. Like what, what is this? And then uh, Strans Strawberry is that the guy's name for it? Gonzaga? Strother. Strother. Hit this three from the logo. I said, get out. Okay, game over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> game set and match. Yeah, it ain't. It ain't UCLA's night. But um, but y'all land my plane though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I learned that online. Somebody said, like, "You done talking?" Y'all land my plane. I'm gonna right. try that out on the episode. Yeah. Um, Edie, well, we knew everybody in the mama knew that they, they was getting that man. Um, second coming of y'all, mean. But uh, <laughs> but Edie, Edie was well deserved. I don't know what happened to him in in Fairly Dickens. There was nobody showed up for for do that night. I don't I don't know. What happened? But um, regular season player of the year, yeah. Well deserved. He was dominant. Mm -hmm. So yeah, congrats to those guys for winning their awards. Um, Congratulations, you know, gentlemen. And you know that was season. That was the story of the end of the men's tournament. So you know it was a crazy year. No one saw any of that coming. But Nobody. you know that's what I kind of look at too. Is like. You know, maybe with this transfer portal NIL money, who knows if these mid-major schools can kind of swoop in, gain some traction, pick up some of these stars, and become like a powerhouse team for one year that we saw. Um, oh, oh, look, it's here. It's coming. To like, try and dismantle those big teams that we see all the time. It's, it's coming. Like, like we're in that in that particular era now where you – you know, it used to be where you give us two or three years to get our recruits in, to get our guys in, and then we got people have to sit for a year. All that, all that has changed. All that's out the window now. Like you have the resources. Cause it used to be you could sneak money under the table. Mm -hmm. Now everything above the table. So anything go. We giving you, uh, we giving your mama a car. We give your daddy a car. We give your sister. You know, we we give you these particular deals. Yeah. Not even on 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 record. Still, it's still under the table. I think. But <laughs> it's like if you want to tweet about your daily life, here's some extra money. Right. Yeah. Uh, cause you know you're making yourself a little bit of a. Right. Outside agent. Right. Anyway. And, I, and I love it. But um, and now it's all about the the um, recruiting now and, and the chemistry, because you can have all these players. The question is, will these people, players come together in jail? And you look at like, um, I think John Calipari, you know, he's always good with bringing, doing the one and done thing. You know, mm -hmm. or even Coach K was, was big with one and done. And uh, but now the game has switched to. It's back to going back to upperclassmen, see people who been in it, in it for three or four years, the underdog people who, who people forgot about, and they had to work to get 
to this particular moment. Yeah. Because I demand a lot of these boys who are going into the league right now ain't ready to have these boys going, man, to feed their family. We don't hear from them for eight years. Mm -hmm. So with this NIL money, man, this transfer portal thing, you know, I'm kind of leery on how many times you can transfer. You know, some people have been transferring five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. You know, I don't know. But 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 as far as NIL, I, I love it. I love yeah. it. Let me ask you this on, off the record. Um, who was the better, best conference? Ben Hurley has said the Big East was the best conference. We live in Big 12 country. We think the Big 12 was the best conference. Who was the best conference? I still believe it was the Big 12. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, Big East, you got UConn, Marquette, uh, you know, Xavier had. Xavier was good. Deer, Deer, Deer. Yeah. You oh, no, no, no. They weren't me. They was good. Xavier was good. Yeah. Xavier. So. Um, you know, those three teams on the Big East kind of stick out to me a little bit. But, mm -hmm. like, you know, I think back to the Big 12 this year, you know, even for the red – what was it? The Oklahoma, Oklahoma State matchup. Oklahoma wins four games at one point in the regular season. Yeah. But, you know, you look at their record, you're like, oh, my God, they beat Alabama by, like, 22 points. Right, yeah. They face Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State's not great either, but – they play a close game with them because they're their rival. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every every game of the Big Twelve seemed like it was a dogfight. Every night you had to bring you had to bring your, your bootstraps every night in the Big Twelve. Even Texas Tech smoked some people. Like what? Texas Tech? Wait a minute, they beat Kansas State. Wait, wait a minute, man. So I think uh, Big, I think Big Twelve. I think Big Twelve. And I did watch some Big East basketball this year. And I, and I watched St. John's and uh, I watched Seton Hall. Tough. Well, it was tough, tough teams, but um, I still give it the edge to, to yeah. the 12. And Dan Hurley, listen here, but, you know, St. John's going to hire Rick Pitino. Now, now, now it get interesting. So it get interesting let's now, see, man. Let's see if his stance on Big East basketball can kind of live up to his uh, <laughs> yeah. idea there. Oh, oh, they, oh, they coming. Big, Big East is coming, boy. Oh, they, it's going, man, good times in the garden. Good time. Right. So you want to dive in a bit? Women's battle yeah, battle? we got to go women's final four. But this, this, this is where all the drama took place this weekend. Boy, they was cutting up this weekend, bro. Um, I want to give a shout out to the Virginia Tech women's team because they weren't talking. We ain't, we ain't heard from y'all since Friday night after y'all after y'all played that It's been about Don Staley. It's been about Caitlin Clark, and it's been about Angel Reese and every, and all the other uh, components of those three teams. Virginia Tech. Ain't nobody talking about y'all, but I'm but on his casual highlights. I salute you and give you credit on your great season. Now let now, now, now let's get to everything else that that went down, shall we? Um, LSU handled business. Virginia, Virginia, excuse me, Virginia Tech was up. Um, so I didn't I didn't get a chance to watch that particular game. I was I was out in in in, in the streets, uh, working, but I I heard a lot of the second half, and Virginia, Virginia Tech couldn't close. You know. LSU handled business. Andrew Reese and them took care of business and moved on. But the game of the night I was waiting on, bro. America was waiting on. We was waiting on Caitlin Clark. And what did Don Staley have cooked up for this Caitlin Clark? I've been waiting for like five days, bro. I said, ooh, this going to be Caitlin Clark. Because I've watched Caitlin Clark this year several times. Um, I, I watched her in a regular season game against Indiana. Mm -hmm. Hit a game winner at uh, Hawkeye Arena. Um, you said you saw her in the Big Ten tournament, hit another game winner against Indiana. God, dog, boy, Indiana get lit up by Caitlin. Um, but the moral of the story between Iowa and South Carolina, man, is very simple. Don Staley didn't make adjustments. I think Don Staley is a great coach. Some people have criticized her that she can't coach. I said, no, no, no. She just got out coached that particular night. Um, Caitlin was Caitlin and was pretty much carried has carried a team and dropped like 41 on them. But I got to give credit to uh, Zaire Cook. Zaire Cook had about 25, 27 points that night. Um, so, but the, but the story was, man, South Carolina upset. And can Iowa take down the mighty Tiger? I think a lot of people didn't expect Iowa to come out. We we thought 36 and 0, okay, they about to roll past and we about to see LSU on Sunday, all SEC matchup. Mm -hmm. What's your what's your take on it, man? We got I've been talking too much. Let me. Let's go. <laughs> I just had to get all that out of my chest for just a yeah. moment. 
you know, I didn't see the Virginia Tech LSU game, but I did see like the last couple minutes of the uh, Iowa South Carolina game, and I was shocked. I, you know, if you would have asked me a week or two ago who was going to win a national championship for the women, it was my pick would have been South Carolina. Uh, South Carolina faced a tough test down that stretch of the Iowa game, and you know, Kaitlyn Clark for the player she is. Her teammates stepped up too by playing hard nosed defense down the stretch to kind of hold South Carolina in check. Um, And, you know, there was like a minute and a half left, and Iowa was up by four, I think. South Carolina also just was not able to cash in on last possessions. Yeah. Um, So they sent Iowa to the free throw line. And, you know, Kaylin Clark had to be the one to take those free throw shots, and she was. And she nailed some key important free throws to kind of help secure that win for Iowa. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was it was an amazing game. You know, credit to Leah Boston too. She's probably gonna be like the number one, number two pick in the WNBA oh, draft. Yeah. Um so the, the career um that those South Carolina seniors it's like one twenty one and nine for for their four year, four or five year career at South Carolina with a national championship under their belt, three final fours. Um, imagine if they would have did it, what they would have done in 2020, because they were going to be the number one overall seed on, on, on the women's bracket in 2020, pre uh, before the pandemic shut everything down. So, man, just a job well done by, by those by those ladies. I mean, now we had the drama afterward. Uh, Don Staley calling out the media because there was rumblings in the background and, and things going back about her team. Um, we're gonna address that here in a moment. We're gonna we gonna, I'm gonna bunch all it up here in a moment, but I'm I wanna get to the to this Sunday game, man. Sunday, ladies and gentlemen, boy, everybody, first of all, I don't like how they had a 3 30 time start. I, to me, that I'm like, why can't we be in prime time like at seven o'clock? Was it because everybody come getting out of church, you know, and and mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe it, it was the day we experimenting again. I I don't remember the afternoon championship game in years. Um but the fireworks took took place between Iowa and LSU, and I really think Iowa took for granted LSU. Now LSU, on the other hand, felt some type of way because they was like, "Oh, Caitlin doing all this driving and talking out the side of her neck. <laughs> she ain't gonna be doing all that on us." And literally, the difference defensively, they shut all that driving down of Caitlin Clark. I mean, the driving or drama. No, no, hey, the driving, driving, okay. Dri- driving to the hole. All right. They ain't, they ain't start. The drama was still was there. <laughs> I think you know, play, play is trash talk, man. And they were probably saying some stuff during the game. But I think the, the, the key takeaways besides Angel versus Caitlin, I think one of the key takeaways was the officiating. Excuse my language, the officiating was shitty, bro. Like it was, it was old. like, how did your Angel Reese, Alexis Morris? I want to talk about that. On the bench with two fouls. If it was not for Jasmine Carson, who, in my opinion, was the player of the game, and I said that on my one of my pages, Jasmine seven for seven from the field, five for five from three point line, really helped them. They were like up 17, 16, 17 points at the half. Like it was, it was that was amazing to me, man. And uh, yeah, I want to elaborate on what you saw the first half and, and your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, LSU just shut Iowa down in that, you know, I feel like it was probably throughout the whole game. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm looking at the score, I'm like, dang, I was getting canned a little bit. They're down by plus 10 with yeah. five, six minutes left. So it was a whirlwind of emotion probably for Iowa. Um, I did not understand, you talk about the officiating, I did not understand the technical foul that Caitlin Clark got called on her for. There's a stoppage in play. She happens to have the ball in her hand. Does a behind the back flip, and the ball goes to like the baseline. Yeah, that was baloney to me. So I'm kind of wondering, like, you know, what are the referees trying to incite here yeah. by, you know, there you you can't you can't judge a game by its officiating so much, but like, if you're going to call a technical foul on something like that in the first half. Mm-hmm. You should already be making your judgments on calls way before that happens. Yeah. So, so there was um, also Kim Mulkey challenged the call on. There was an elbow the uh, 
the Iowa Hawkeyes, and I'm, I'm looking up her name right now. Uh, I think it's Makina Warnock. No, it's not Makina. The girl, the girl down low, and she and, and she just uh, I think it was Makina Warnock, number fourteen. Oh no, 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 it was uh, Monica Senezo. I'm about to I'm about to jack her name up, <laughs> but she literally put an elbow to the girl's face. <laughs> And took her neck. You remember that? And and and, and Kim Moki said, "I need to reveal that because that was, it was. I don't know. I know we shouldn't talk about ref officiating like that. But oh, we got certain things should be should be obvious uh-huh. in my in my opinion. Because that those two calls, Kaylin getting Kaylin getting on getting four fouls, being on the bench, weren't able to really see Kaylin. But but the girl still dropped thirty one. Still dropped thirty eight for nineteen from from three. Yeah yeah yeah. She she became a jump shooter, but. Man, when you down seventeen, and then and then you get up, you get back in it like you're down nine or eight. Mm-hmm. It ain't happening. And also, we got to give credit to Alexis Morris. Um, second half, sh- she got cooking, <laughs> and because she was on the bench most of the first half, and um, and then the then all the drama came out, and we have the face. This you don't see me, you can't see me. Let me show you the ring. <laughs> Man, my God! And and social media blew up. We got people calling pieces of crap and 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 a toad and and you're unsportsmanlike. I'm like, well, dog, I play Monopoly. Uh, I can't trash talk when I play Monopoly or Battleship. Like, man, like, bro, this is this is getting upset. I'm like, we talking about like Al. I was like, we talking about practice. We talking about trash talk. You should hear the stuff the NBA players be saying. So, right. so women can't talk, trash talk. All they can do is just. Ah! You know, it's just, you know, and in my opinion, let me know a couple of things. I believe sports is supposed to bring people together. Like we having this conversation on this show, it's brought us together from different cultures, and we should be able to learn from each other. And I think once we learn from each other, I think we should make adjustments. To uh, okay, that's the per- that's the way Angel Reese is. That's her style of things. This is the way Caitlin Clark is. And Caitlin Clark, you uh, you told me came out and said, hey, you know, it should, it's not a, a big deal. You know, we was out there trash talking, and this, this is what happened. Um, now, you you had an interesting point about Angel Reese and your, and your take on it, that, that she went up to Caitlin Clark and, and, and rubbed it in her face. Here's, here's the biggest thing I think about it, and I have a couple different takes on it maybe, you know, and this is going to dive into detail. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with this. When Iowa plays South Carolina, Kaylin Clark is down in the box. South Carolina, big girl, center, maybe, mm-hmm. forward, big, tall, forward girl. Yeah. She has the ball at the top of the key. Uh-huh. And Kaylin Clark, you know, she's in the box. She's, like, waving her off. Yeah, she did. Like, you know, they people take it as, like, oh, yeah, like, she's not going to shoot that. Like, it's no big deal. And, you know, I respect Kaylin Clark's competitiveness for doing something like that mm-hmm. because it's like, hey, I'm going to challenge you to take that shot if you want it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, she doesn't take the shot anyway. Yeah. And, you know, the media and national attention just blows up into flames like, oh, that's not respectable mm-hmm. of women's college basketball or whatever. And I'm thinking, you know, are we, hang- are we handing out like participation trophies in this <laughs> league or what? <laughs> like these girls also want to play in the WNBA. And we know that WNBA is a little bit more competitive, too, in some sense. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I saw that as like petty, mm-hmm. you know. Like, if Caitlin Clark's going to, like, wave someone off, like, yeah, I'm not going to guard her or whatever, like, fine. Like, that's cool. I respect the competitiveness out of it. But the national media, you know, you guys always make it big about hearsay and what you view when it's not even that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that somehow, I know Angel Reese and LSU – took offense to that even though they're playing iowa not south carolina the national championship playing iowa they went back and said yeah we're we don't if iowa guards us that way we're gonna obliterate them and you know lsu did a little bit of studying but the biggest thing i saw in that final 15 seconds of the lsu iowa game you know 
while the Angel Reese goes up to Caitlin Clark, doesn't really like go up to her directly, kind of like stands back a little bit, does the hand in your face, right. the ring showing thing. Caitlin Clark's like, can maybe see her out of the corner of her eye, maybe isn't paying attention to it, but I'm thinking, my, fir- my first reaction was like, Angel, what did Caitlin do to you directly mm. for you to show that type of emotion? Mm. Plus, you're up by 15 points, mm. 20 points maybe, mm. with so little time left. Like, if anything, go walk away from the situation. Go celebrate with your teammates. Don't put yourself in that media eye to make it a big question for days and have people have to come out and answer to something that they probably don't really feel like they need to answer to. I got you. Okay. So it's like, I think Angel Reese should have probably not done what she did. I think she would have just gone back, celebrated with her teammates the way she did, um, and kind of just let it be and showed some a little bit, maybe a little bit more respectable attitude, in my opinion, and just kind of like, you know, you guys beat Iowa fair and square. You guys shut them down even though Caitlin Clark had 30, 40 plus points. Um, so I think Angel Reese should have maybe been a little bit more mature in her actions and just gone to the sideline and celebrate with teammates in the end. I see what you're saying. Fair, fair, fair judgment. I'm not going to uh, judge everybody's opinions different. Um, I look at it. I understand where you're coming from. Now, the, ce- the celebration part, because everybody's, well, she can do this. Caitlin did it in the game. Well, she was just doing that. But what you were saying was she literally came up to got got close enough. Face she to wanted to directly do it to her. Do it, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Now, on my end, I'm I'm going back to the beginning of the game and during the game. What was said and done between those two particular players? Okay, they went on the on the floor a lot, but what was said between each other's teams? Another thing you were saying was how LSU was like was coming out and saying that. Caitlin and them ain't going to be doing that to us in, in, on, in the game. And I believe it was it was like Michael Jordan trying to find something. In the la- you know, remember the last dance? He would find some type of bullet bit, bulletin board material to get him fired up for the game. I think maybe that's what LSU was looking at, trying to find bulletin board material to be fired up about. Because, we, because Iowa did not, like, blatantly come out and say, like, we're going to kick LSU's butt and mm-hmm. this is what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. LSU took it to another level and be like, oh, we're going to study them. And then we're going to like publicly open talk about it mm-hmm. and be like, okay, if they play us like that way, then they're in trouble. Mm-hmm. Like they, they made it into something bigger than what it should have never been. I believe, and I believe we, the media, and, and it goes back to your definition of what sportsmanship is and what, and what is, um, classy and not classy and i mean it's good to, to, to like do trash talking and different things of that nature but you gotta know the moment i think and just to add to what you said about uh andrew reese it's similar to, to the time we was at a basketball game and the dude ended the game and took the ball they was up by like 20 points and he slammed up the ball to get more points i said man that was some bull <laughs> some bull stuff man so you got to be in my opinion you have to know the moment Know the situation. Nothing wrong with celebrating. Hey, you want to celebrate? Hey, baby, do your dance. Do, do your dance. Hey, 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 get jiggy with it. Do that. But, but um, certain things, certain things, people are watching, and so that's why you have these different perspectives. And I, and I don't even want to say. Some people have gone as the links to say it was a black white issue, and, and say that it was racism. I'm not gonna say it was racism. I think it was maybe biased and maybe even the way certain people were raised to, to see the game or, or, or values and how it was taught. That's why I, I went back earlier. I say sports brings people together. It shouldn't divide us, but we should learn from each other. And be like, okay. What could I have done better in this situation? So, so, so this, cause we're talking about Angel versus Caitlin and not celebrating LSU right now when winning the championship and the game and then Jill Biden, crazy, but going to come out here and say, well, we're going to give our participation trophies. Mm-hmm. Like, we're supposed to be celebrating a champion <clears throat> right now. And we talking about, well, she was right, they was wrong. This, No, nah, we – it sometimes you got to be, okay, how can we celebrate the champion in this game? 
and both of them making NIL money. We need we need to clap that for something because you know they they did from what I was reading. They had three quarters of a million dollars in NIL money right now going into next year. We got to clap that up. They're getting their money uh, and, and they're getting scholarships. You know they're playing the game that they love. And um, to me, that's that's the sad part that we that we didn't get to celebrate these particular women in in, in LSU in in the dominant performance that they did to Iowa to, to win the championship. We didn't even celebrate Kim Mulkey. Like this is her second school. She, she, she's been a champion everywhere. She's been a champion in college. She, uh, at, at, at Louisiana tech as a player, as an assistant coach, then goes to Baylor builds that program up and wins two titles there. And then comes back to back, come back home to Louisiana and wins a national championship. And that's, that's to me, that that's the stuff that gets, taken away but i get it because we got to have these are the kind of kind of conversations that can either make us better people or sets us back further than, than where we need to be mm-hmm. yeah man speaking of jill biden man what the hell she was talking about bro what that was about was it invite the runner-ups of the tournament right. to the hey oh, man, man. jill did, not, she, did not... she did she feel like caitlin clark put on such a great performance that Iowa should be recognized too for maybe knocking off North South Carolina. Bro, you that wasn't no good game. They got blown out by 17 points. 17 at half and 17 for the game. Wasn't no good, man. Listen, I think she was trying to ease the situation, maybe. I don't know. But you, you saw my letter on you, you saw my letter on, on the book, right? What I wrote about uh to uh, my open letter to, to Dr. Jill Biden. Mm-hmm. Told Dr. Jill, I said, in that case, why don't you invite the women champion, NIT champions of uh, University of Kansas, women basketball team? Hell, San Diego State get an invite. Sure, we might as well invite all 64 teams, <laughs> <laughs> men and women. Boy, that'd be the biggest cookout in White House history. Be, and, and have little baby play uh, low down. Play, play that song. Everybody mm-hmm. <laughs> cutting up in there, man. But, um, but yeah, I don't know, man. We, now we get our participating trophy, man. <laughs> yeah, it was insane. That was crazy. I don't know. So I, I, what I did was I created uh, a list of the all Final Four women's and men's team casual highlight style. Uh, for the women, I got Caitlin Clark and, and, and Andrew Reese. I got Jasmine Carson because without her twenty, without her twenty points in the first half to carry LSU, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be reigning. That they wouldn't be a national champion, in my opinion. Also, Alexis Moore for LSU. And I got Z- uh, Zaya Cook for South Carolina, who kept um, who kept South Carolina in the game against Iowa. That's my women's uh, all Final Four team. The men, I got Lamont Butler, San Diego State, Matt uh, Bradley, San Diego State, Aljar Martin, uh, Florida Atlantic, um, Isaiah Wong, Miami. Adam, Adama Sonogo, UConn. We might need to add uh, Ray Allen the second, <laughs> aka Hawkins, to, the, to that to that six man list. But this was the um, the final four, my all final four team for men's and women's. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would maybe throw Jordan Hawkins in there. Jordan Hawkins, yeah. Maybe add the FAU guy, mm-hmm. or one of the San Diego State guys. Okay. But I, I put I put Butler in there because he hit the game winner. Yeah, and so he, I, I may put him ahead of Bradley. Brad, okay, and he, yeah, because I know Bradley had twenty two, but the key bucket was uh, from Lamont Butler. Mm-hmm. So yeah. so yeah, Jordan Hawkins, yeah. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff. He lands his plane. All right. <laughs> All right. So we about to end wrap the show up, and we got a couple quick takes for you. Several quick takes. And uh, we are we already we already jumped on Dr. Jill Biden. You know, she po 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 Dr. Jill. She 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 just wanted the best. She just wanted to have kumbaya moment, man. But uh, but yeah, bless her, bless her little heart. Um, let us start with uh, since we're on sportsmanship, I'm gonna start with this one. North Carolina state senators, senators in the state of North Carolina are looking to ban participation trophies in youth sports. What's your take on that? I mean, what, what are we teaching them then? Like, are we teaching them just to 
participate in sports and never compete in a high level? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, hey, Phil, they going to be sad. Do they watch sports? Do the Senators watch sports? Look, That's what I want to know. Hey. Field day gonna be sad for the for the elementary. You know, everybody got a ribbon. You know, yeah. you had a seven place ribbon, eight place ribbon. You ain't getting no ribbon. You might, you barely <laughs> might get a third place ribbon. And stuff. Like here, you finished the race. Like, well, you know, let's go ahead and just give you a medal. Yeah, nah, so, and, and shutting that nonsense. But it teaches about winning in life and not settling. So I kind of I find it interesting. Like you want you want to be a winner and not a loser. We want more people to succeed and not have a give up mentality. So that'd be right. interesting. Interesting. Okay. What you got? So I saw this today. Someone in 2022 on DraftKings had picked UConn to win the national championship. Um, they wagered $100 back in 2022. Obviously, UConn wins. They come out with $10,000 in their pocket. So with that, I want to ask you, who's your early pick to win the 2024 national championship? A couple people. But do I have to pick? I got to pick one. But you disregard the transfer portal and NIL money just because that's always just a random search. Okay, so 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 we're gonna do the, the ESPN slash uh, casual. So casual highlights way too early national championship pick as of right now. I'm going to go with um. Ooh, oh man, I guess I'm gonna go with the safe pick and go Duke. Okay, fair enough. You know, they got John Shire, second yeah, year coming second in. Uh, don't know what their NBA level talent will look like if the team was leaving, but it's a safe pick. Right. Uh, yeah. Because uh, part of me is like, well, you can go to UConn, uh, the, 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 the new blue blood. And no blue. one repeats at this level anymore. I'm no, going to go oh. throw that out there. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Who, who, would you, who would you pick? Oh, man. That's a tough one. I, I can't imagine a mid major swooping in, even with any talent they might have with as long as they keep players. Um, gosh. I mean, you, I would maybe think that North Carolina could maybe make a trip back if you were Davis can rebound a little bit. Ooh, babe, um, babe cock, yeah, yeah, come back. But, you know, I, I, I'm going to go on a limb here and just say that, you know, Will Rodney Terry in Texas kind of overtake the Big 12 a little bit? And if they can make another late run like they did this year, if they can kind of get over that hump in his second year, and that see, would be something. And see, they got a full year now. Uh -huh. They got a full year with Rodney Terry. and Because I believe he wants to implement stuff now. He was still doing stuff from Chris Beard. And, but now he got a full year. This is his program, so he's going to model it. That's a good pick. I like, I like that. I think what – you got a couple of McDonald's All Americans coming in, and they're not losing anybody to the to transfer or graduation, right? Maybe one or two people. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, they're gonna be nice. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Texas, I know a lot of people say, "Well, Kansas the team to beat." Man, listen, Texas is coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Y'all forgot in Manhattan, Kansas, K State coming. You know what? What they do? Um, Baylor's still in the in the mix. Texas Tech. We need to watch Texas Tech because somebody from that, the, the gentleman who was at North Texas is the coach of Texas Tech now. So what they going to do? Uh -huh. <laughs> so a lot of good, man, a lot of great basketball coming up next, next year, man. I wish it would start today, but I get it. We got to go through the summer, enjoy the summer. And when you're bored in the wintertime and uh, it's snowy outside, you got college basketball. All right, so – Roughly 10 million viewers watch the Women's National Championship game. That's like the highest in any women's championship game history. Were they coming for the tea? No, they came to watch the game, but they got the tea. <laughs> the mess. <laughs> what happened after it, man? What's your, what's your thought? Is, is the women's game going to continue to grow going forward, or does it take a step back? And also, do you see them possibly going to like a – Football stadium pretty soon to have their final four. I don't think they go to a football stadium for the final four, but I do kind of hope the women's game picks up a little bit. You know, I think the viewership kind of was high level this year because of Caitlin Clark in it. Um, you know, she ended up being the wooden player of the year for women's yeah. basketball. So, and the fact that they knocked off South Carolina, I think, was big. 
Um, I, I can't comment too much on LSU just because I don't know much about their team beyond the fact that Kim Mulkey was coaching them this year. Yeah. Um, but I do think the fan base for women's college basketball was big because of Caitlin Clark and Iowa in the national championship. And I would love to see next year Paige Becker for UConn. So he comes back a little come back. Yeah, I want to see. I'm interested in seeing that. I'm interested, you know, what South Carolina does. There's so many storylines. So that's one thing with women's basketball. You you grow with a player for three or four years. Men's basketball, and you can see it now, there was really not too many storylines. The, the closest storyline to me this year in men's basketball was the stuff that Keontae Johnson, uh, Marquise Noel, and what Kansas State was doing with the transfer portal and, and FAU. But, but, but with this story, like you have players that you follow three or four years and the stuff that, that they're like, Kaylin coming back. We, we're going to see what, what that, what's going to happen with that. Yeah. You have on the West Coast, you got like teams like UCLA, you got Colorado. Oh, you got Duke, by the way, with Carol Lawson coaching them. Uh, so you have a lot of little rivalries, Stanford, Indiana. I mean, Miami made an elite eight, an elite eight run. So you have a lot of teams that um, can make a run, like competitive. Like they're going to they're gonna put their heart out there <laughs> and do what they got to do. So I'm excited to see the growth of the, uh, the game of women's basketball. Yeah. So we'll kind of see how it turns out next year even. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one, the last little take I kind of have, sample size. So looking at the NBA, Nikola Jocic has been the MVP for, I think, two or two straight years. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're saying now that Joel Embiid may have passed him for this year's MVP title. Um, Jocic averages 24 points a game, 11.9 rebounds. Joel Embiid, though, 33.3 points and 10.2 rebounds. Um do you think that's a legit chance that Joel Embiid kind of surpasses Jocic and doesn't let him win it for a third time? I think it's a good chance with those particular numbers. And, and the times I've plugged in to watch Joel Embiid play, he doesn't have um, – I mean, he has James Harden, but it's not the same James Harden that was in Houston. I think James Harden slowed down a step or two, in my, in my opinion. Uh, I'm going to say, throw, throw all these awards out for just a moment. Philadelphia has to go to the NBA Finals this year. In order for Doc Rivers to keep his job, in order to take your game to the next level, Joel Embiid has to lead the Philadelphia 76 to the NBA Finals. Not a conference final. You definitely can't end it out in the second round. because Doc Rivers is going to be gone. Conference finals, Doc Rivers still, in my opinion, might be gone. For... Joel to solidify his position as probably one of the best in the game right now. He had they have to get to the NBA Finals. They have to. They have to come out the East. You, you got to figure out a way how to beat Milwaukee or Boston. You got to figure out. You got to figure that out. Yeah, they got to do that. Um, same way in the West with them. Y'all been in first place for a long time. Your coach come out of call yourself right now because y'all and, and y'all y'all just coasting right now. For Jokic to go to that next level, I mean, we know both of y'all are top two centers in the game right now. You got to go to the NBA Finals. You just can't just go to the Western Conference Finals. I know that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sexy topic to talk about the Lakers and what they're going to do, and it's, a, it's, it's cute to talk about what the Warriors are going to do. But if Denver is serious and it's about their life, you have to go to the NBA Finals. We're not, mm-mm, this ain't about Western Conference. Oh, we had a good year. We made the final loss. No, you got to go to the Finals. So MVP, you can get MVP all you want to. But at the end of the day, they're going to be talking about how many rings on your finger. Yeah. They, they're thinking that if Philadelphia doesn't win it this year, then is it kind of like a plan, a failed experiment with James Harden and Joel Embiid? It didn't work. You, you play to win the game. We, we, we're we paying you these millions of dollars to win. To, to, to win. We got we got the coaching. We, we got everything for you to win. And y'all not winning. Which it's also looking like now, too, Milwaukee is going to probably get that one seed in the East. So Philadelphia would have to get through Milwaukee and Boston. Boston. See, that's um, – <laughs> I know I picked – a couple weeks ago I picked Boston to get the one seed. Boston has, like, very little chance to do that now. Um, so credit to Milwaukee probably going to get that one seed. 
those throughout the playoffs as long as they're in it. Is Chris – here's the question. I haven't been watching Milwaukee too much. Is Chris – what is the – What's the status of Chris Middleton? Will he be back for the playoffs? I didn't even know he was hurt. Yeah, I, I thought he was – it's been about Drew Holiday. He kind of came back for a while, so I thought he was fine. Okay. If that brother get back in there. If that brother get back on that floor. Yeah. Man, listen. <laughs> they might be they might be dancing me walking. I, I haven't made my, my picks yet, but all I know is Philadelphia and Denver's on the clock. And I'm just going to leave it just like that. Mm-hmm. T. Scott or Tyler, where can they find you at, sir, on the medias of, of, uh, of social? Uh, Instagram, T. Scott, 1288. Um, Photo.kingdom1 for photography uh, inquiries. So, uh, yeah, just be able to check me out there. Yes, sir. Listen, my name is Al High. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of uh, Casual Highlights, the podcast on audio and uploaded on the YouTube channel. Now, you can listen to this show as as well as other great shows at uh, bs3network.com. Listen, until next time, Al High, Tyler Scott. Man, we'll, we'll, we'll catch you later. Peace. Peace.